Welcome to Washington Talk. I'm Eun Jung Cho. President Joe Biden met with Chinese President Xi Jinping for four hours in an effort to ease tensions between the two countries. The U.S. and South Korea updated a bilateral security agreement to counter North Korea's advancing nuclear and missile threats. Today, we discuss the APEC summit and security in Northeast Asia. And our deterrence commitment to the ROK remains ironclad. That includes the full range of our nuclear, conventional, and missile defense capability. 만약 북한이 핵을 사용한다면 한미의 적극적이고 압도적이며 결정적인 대응에 직면하고 김정은 정권의 종말로 이어질 것임을 확인합니다. In the studio with me, Mr. Christopher Johnstone, Senior Advisor and Japan Chair at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Mr. Johnstone was the Director for East Asia at the National Security Council under President Biden. He also served as the Director for Japan and Oceanian Affairs at the NSC, Principal Director for South and Southeast Asia, as well as Director for Northeast Asia in the Office of the Secretary of Defense. Also joining us, Mr. Scott Snyder, Director of U.S.-Korea Policy at the Council on Foreign Relations. Mr. Snyder is appointed as the new president of the Korea Economic Institute of America. Previously, Mr. Snyder was the director of U.S.-Korea Policy Center at the Asia Foundation. Mr. Snyder's latest book is the U.S.-South Korea Alliance, Why It May Fail and Why It Must Not. Welcome to the program. Thank, Thank you. you. Great to be here. Now, Mr. Johnstone, there's a series of bilateral summits on the sidelines of the APEC summit. What would be the top priorities for the United States, Japan, and South Korea? Yeah, the APEC summit is an annual event, but all the focus this year is on the bilateral meetings on the side. So the main uh, focus for the United States, of course, for President Biden was the meeting with Xi Jinping. Four hours, uh, I think, and to some degree, was successful in stabilizing the relationship, modest progress and resuming mill-to-mill -mill. Uh, talks, for example, progress on cooperation related to drugs, counter-narcotics, uh, and some other items related to uh, grassroots exchange. But fundamentally, it remains a difficult relationship uh, for Japan, too. Uh, bilat with between Prime Minister Kishida and, and President Xi, the first in a year, also a very important focus, a shorter meeting. I think this is a reminder, actually, when you think about four hours with, uh, for President Biden, 65 minutes for Prime Minister Kishida, and we'll see on President Yoon. This reflects the Chinese view of order, right? That there are certain countries are more important than others, that there's a hierarchy of influence uh, and importance to Beijing. Uh, and I think that was reflected this week, and it's important to keep that in mind. Mr. Snyder, in that meeting between President Biden and Xi, they are out to manage relations. And President Biden emphasized his commitment to the complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Do you think the North Korea issue could be an area where U.S. and China could cooperate again? Would China get rid of its obstructive stance at the U.N. Security Council? Well. I actually believe that even though the Korean Peninsula was mentioned in the president's statement, uh, it really did not rank highly enough on the list of priorities between the U.S. and China, uh, likely to make a difference in terms of China's approach to dealing with the issue. Uh, and so, I mean, in a way, what's really interesting at the U.N., maybe we might see China deciding to move a little bit closer to the U.S. position because they know that Russia is going to be the primary defender of North Korea uh, under current circumstances. So in a way, it could be a freebie. But frankly, it's possible but not likely. 
would be my interpretation. I don't think that the Chinese position is really going to change based on the order of priority uh, of the Korean Peninsula issue in the context of the bilateral dialogue. Mr. Johnstone, President Xi told President Biden that China's preference is for the peaceful reunification with Taiwan. But he did went on to say the conditions where force may be used. And uh, senior U.S. officials also said that President Xi made orders to the People's Liberation Army to get ready to attack Taiwan by 2027. So given President Xi's latest comments, how should South Korea and Japan um, prepare for a Taiwan contingency? And what kind of stance should they take on the issue of Taiwan. Yeah, yes, there's still significant tension in the Taiwan Strait. I was just in Taiwan last week, uh, was part of a, a, a delegation that met with President Tsai. And that government is under intense pressure from the mainland as they approach an election in Taiwan. Massive disinformation campaign, re regular military exercises by the PLA in close proximity to Taiwan. Uh, so there's a lot of tension. Still today, I, I am one who does not believe that Xi Jinping has a firm timeline, uh, that, tw that 2027 is somehow an inevitable moment of attack. Uh, so I believe uh, we can still shape decision making in Beijing on the Taiwan question. And I think Seoul and Tokyo have a role to play. Uh, I think deterrence remains very important. And so uh, a consistent message uh, from both governments. The peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait is a vital interest for both Japan and Korea, uh, is key. Um, and militarily, I think Japan's buildup is an important part of deterrence. Uh, and I think Korea too can signal that through its own defense investments, uh, that it will be ready to preserve deterrence on the Korean Peninsula in the event U.S. forces uh, are called upon for the defense of Taiwan. So I think, I think both Japan and Korea have a vital role to play, uh, and the deterrence is still possible. Mm -hmm. And to maintain the rules-based international order in the region, do you think South Korea should voice a stronger voice in support of Taiwan as much as Japan does? Well, I think, I think it's very positive that President Yoon, um, in the, uh, in, in, when he visited Washington earlier this year and in other opportunities has emphasized in agreement with President Biden the, the importance of peace and stability in the, in the Taiwan Strait. Uh, and I think Korea should, should continue to send that message. It's vital that China understand that a conflict over Taiwan is not just a, a China-Taiwan, a China-US matter, that it's a matter that will implicate the world and that there will be a global response. Uh, and I think Korea's voice in that is very important. And Mr. Johnstone, President Yoon and Prime Minister Kishida met for the seventh time this year, and they're also attending a forum on technology cooperation at Stanford together. However, public approval of the Kishida cabinet has sunk to a new low of 21 percent. Wouldn't the reconciliation with South Korea be reversed in a future Japanese government? Yeah, it was very positive that they met again uh, uh, bilaterally and that they're going to do this, uh, this technology forum uh, at Stanford. Uh, it's certainly the case that Kishida is facing political headwinds. His popularity is down. It's been decreasing over the last few weeks. Um, it's not a crisis yet. I, I think his position is secure for the time being, but it's certainly the case that it's fragile. But look, what I would say is, uh, you know, this is democracy, right? Leaders change. They come and go. It is the inevitable feature of things. And that's what made the Camp David agreements earlier this year so important because they represented an attempt to institutionalize the trilateral dialogue and mechanisms of cooperation, the leader level, the secretary level, minister level, uh, and, mo and in multiple areas. Um, so I remain optimistic that even if leaders leave the scene in any of these countries, um, that this will continue. The basis for cooperation, the strategic rationale for it remains very strong, but it's certainly the case that the leaders in all three countries must continue to embrace the opportunity of, of cooperation, but I'm still optimistic. Now I want to move on to the important security developments in Northeast Asia this week. Mr. Snyder, North Korea tested new solid fuel engines for intermediate range ballistic missiles. Why should we take note of this development and what will likely be the next step? Well, I think that what this testing suggests is that North Korea is going to continue to incorporate solid fuel as the main fuel for its uh, range of missiles, uh, and that it probably is planning on uh, developing and showing and testing 
uh, another element of that suite of capabilities uh, going forward. Uh, we know that uh, we're on the eve of, uh, I think it's rocket testing day or some new holiday that has been named in North Korea. Uh, and I think there's a lot of uh, anticipation about what might happen uh, on that day. Uh, but specifically, I think that the focus is on whether or not we will see a new solid fuel uh, intermediate range ballistic missile uh, tested shortly. And it could be for a submarine. It could be for satellite. We have to wait and see uh, exactly what the use would be. Mr. Johnstone, the State Department has authorized the sale of SM-6 to South Korea, which will be deployed on Aegis destroyers. Up until now, South Korea used SM-2. Why do you think the U.S. government, what's behind this latest decision to give SM-6 to South Korea? And what will be the military strategic advantage to South Korea? This is part of the Biden administration's larger approach of supporting uh, actively the defense modernization of allies, the view that strong allies are good for America and good for deterrence in Asia. And I think this is very much part of that strategy. The SM-6 is a very capable system. It has longer range uh, than the SM-2. It's effective defense against cruise missiles, ballistic missiles, uh, has a strike role, again, anti-ship role uh, that it can play. It's more expensive, so the SM-2 will continue to be part of South Korea's arsenal. Uh, but this is a significant upgrade. It's also a reminder that increasingly, right, the U.S., ROK, and Japanese navies are interoperable, operating the same systems, the Aegis battle system. Uh, so there is a, a technology foundation for deeper operational cooperation uh, that's expanding into the navies in a way that the, uh, that's impressive. So uh, this is a very welcome step. Let me just add, I think that this is really... Um uh, evidence that the alliance has a response to the things that North Korea has been testing. Uh, and so the capabilities that North Korea has been working on so hard in terms of short range ballistic missiles, well, this is the response. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Snyder, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin was in Seoul for an annual security consultative meeting and the SCM in the defense vision defined North Korea as the most pressing threat. The previous vision four years ago didn't mention North Korea. What's behind this change? Well, I do believe that the defense vision shows adaptation to some of North Korea's uh, advances in terms of its modernization. Uh, as well as changes in the regional environment. Uh, you know, there are three prongs to the defense vision that I think were important. One was to elaborate the suite of efforts to coordinate and institutionalize on uh, deterrence responses, uh, including a revision of the uh, tailored uh, deterrence strategy. Uh, secondly, we see modernization uh, in terms of capabilities. Uh, what was most notable to me is uh, an intent to cooperate more actively on development of new technologies. Uh, and then thirdly, in the Indo-Pacific region, uh, the discussion of a network strategy, placing the alliance in the context of a dense defense network of like-minded countries. Uh, and so those are very interesting, I think, adaptations that do reflect, I think, the changes in the security environment in the region. Does it also reflect how South Korean government views North Korea? Then the previous government thought of North Korea as somebody to cooperate with, now more of a threat. Well, deterrence rather than dialogue has been a hallmark of the shift uh, between the Moon uh, and UN administrations. Uh, and uh, so I think, yes, you could say that. Now, Mr. Johnstone, Secretary Austin and Defense Minister Shin wan shik updated the tailored deterrence strategy, and they agreed to expand cooperation of the U.S. shared early warning system. How does this enhance South Korea's capabilities against North Korea's missile threat? Yeah, it's another step forward in strengthening our ability collectively to respond to the North Korean threat, a step forward in integrating the sensors that we have uh, in a way that begins to remove seams between the United States, South Korea, uh, and Japan in dealing with the missile challenge. I would also point to, you know, uh, the day before the SCM, there was a trilateral meeting mm -hmm. between Secretary Austin, um, Minister Shin, uh, and Minister Kihara. And they reaffirmed their commitment to real-time data sharing uh, on missile threats by the end of the year, that that capability will be operational uh, by the end of December. Uh, living up to the commitment that was made at Camp David. So we are really on the path toward 
uh, an integrated missile defense architecture mm -hmm. in some form. And I think that's very good for the security of all three countries. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Snyder, Secretary Austin and Minister Shin also shared thoughts about 2018 Comprehensive Military Agreement. Do you share South Korea's concern that the CMA limits South Korean surveillance against North Korean military activities and that monitoring is essential to prepare for Hamas-like surprise attack? And is it a reasonable decision to suspend the CMA should North Korea launch its um, military surveillance satellite? Well, I do believe that there are elements of the CMA that could uh, inhibit some forms of South Korean uh, surveillance uh, into North Korea. But I also believe that South Korea should not feel a need to be bound by the CMA at this time because the North Koreans clearly have uh, not uh, been following the CMA. Uh, and so I think that... Um, Honestly, I don't think there's necessarily a need to uh, announce or pull out from the CMA. Uh, instead, I think that the right approach would be to treat it kind of like the way we treat the armistice agreement, and that both sides can count the violations but leave the agreement in place. Uh, in some respects, I think a decision to um, pull out from the CMA in response to any North Korean action would just demonstrate how few response options we have available. Uh, to North Korea's uh, continued uh, advances in technology. I, I agree with Scott on this. Uh, I, think, I think he makes some important points. I, I think, you know, the United States has no, no formal position on this, right? I think the U.S. view is this is a bilateral agreement, and therefore it's a bilateral decision whether to sustain it. Um, and I, but from my point of view, um, the costs to South Korea of pulling out would be more significant than the benefits uh, it would gain. I, I certainly understand, as Scott pointed out, some of the implications for readiness, some of the, res the restraint that's imposed on ISR operations, for example. Um, but I think it's to South Korea's ben benefit to maintain the high ground on, say, the, on the CMA. You say it's a bilateral agreement, but U.S. ROC is a military alliance. The CMA also has implications on U.S. military capabilities as well. That's, that's no doubt true, and I'm sure there are behind closed doors discussions on this, but I still believe that at the end of the day, sustaining the CMA is in the rock interest. I think North Korea probably wants South Korea to be the one that abrogates the CMA, that in a sense it's a trap, that it would play into the North Korean and uh, Chinese desire to paint South Korea, the United States, Japan as the aggressors, as the escalators in this. Um, so maintaining the CMA, I believe, is, is still very much in the ROC interest. And as Scott says, South Korea should act as it, need, as it believes it needs to act for its own security. But, but there is a value, a diplomatic value, a moral high ground value in sustaining the CMA. I think the distinction is really between um, maintaining the CMA and being bound by the CMA. And I think that maybe what Chris and I are both saying is that just because the CMA is there on paper, if the North Koreans aren't following it, we don't expect the South Koreans to be obligated to follow it to the letter of the agreement. But there must be a reason why South Korea's defense minister, South Korea's chief of staff, coming out publicly saying that this should be either suspended or withdrawn. There must be some military operational reasons. And Vice Admiral Stuart Mayer, former UN command deputy commander from 2019 to 2021, I interviewed him a few days ago, and he did say, on balance, the CMA weakens the military readiness, which you all agreed to. And then he also said, if he's just thinking purely operationally, he would recommend revoking the agreement. As I've said, I, I mean, I do, I, I do acknowledge that there are uh, readiness um, implications of, of the CMA. Uh, I think my point is simply that um, the, the cost of staying in is lower than the cost of, of abrogating, of formally withdrawing. Uh, and I think from a South Korean perspective, there is still a benefit in highlighting that it is North Korea that it is violating the CMA, that it is Kim Jong-un, this is Kim Jong-un's agreement that he signed and, and pointing to, to, to the North as the violators and South Korea as the upholder I think is a valuable diplomatic message to continue to send. Mr. Snyder, there was an inaugural ministerial meeting between the South Korea and the UN sending states. And since 20. 
2014, the U.S. has been trying to revitalize the U.N. command. Um, how important is the U.N. command in South Korean security? So what's really interesting about the U.N. command in the context of tensions on the Korean peninsula is that in most other conflicts, we don't have something like a U.N. command. And so for that reason, I think that it is uh, something viable to keep. Uh, it has a, um, a force provision um, uh, aspect to it. But I also think, interestingly enough, that it has implications in terms of potential future tension reduction and management of the effort to achieve stabilization on the peninsula. Uh, it comes up from time to time when we talk about the possibility of peace agreements, that there could be a UN role. Uh, and that, I think, is something that might actually be perceived as viable in the, you know, frankly, at this point, unlikely event uh, that we ever get to that point. Uh, there is a potential UN role that has proven viable uh, in other conflict situations as we move uh, from management of conflict to trying to achieve uh, peace. Mr. Johnston, there is a lot of emphasis on the U.S., South Korea, Japan military cooperation these days. And in Korea, there is a view that if the U.N. command were to be expanded, Japan could be a good candidate. How would Japan feel about this? Would Japan like to join there? And how would this influence the security in Northeast Asia? Yeah, in a sense, Japan really already is a member of UNC, if you think about it. There's seven bases in Japan that are designated UNC rear bases. There's a UNC rear commander at Yokota Air Base uh, outside Tokyo. Um, and as President Yoon uh, himself noted in the speech earlier this year, Japan plays a vital role, would play a vital role in the defense of South Korea in the event of a war because of all the force flow and throughput that would go through those seven bases in Japan. So in that sense, Japan is a de facto member of UNC. Um, whether Japan would want to be formally uh, designated as a UNC sending state, I don't know. What I do think uh, is that sh Japan should be accorded UNC member status in dealings on the peninsula. So, for example, when there are meetings that involve the UNC sending states in Korea, I think Japan should be invited to be a part of those. Uh, when there are briefings related to the security situation on the peninsula, uh, Japan should be invited to be part of those as a de facto member of, of, of UNC and as that host for UNC rear. Mm -hmm. And during the Korean War, during Operation Chromite, the amphibious invasion of Incheon, um, it is said that many naval vessels were operated by the Japanese people who knew the landscape very well, and they were actually involved in this um, role during the Korean War. Being the neighboring country and knowing the geography so well, wouldn't Japan have a lot of contributions in the case of South Korean um, contingency? Absolutely. Japan would have a lot of contributions to make. That's a, that's a little known part of history, uh, perhaps not very well known in Japan either. Uh, but you're right. Japan did play an important role in the, in the, in the Korean War. Um, and so, so look, I think, uh, I think it's certainly the case that as uh, that Japan should be more integrated into the discussions about responding to a Korean contingency. I will also say that as Japan develops new capabilities in the coming years, as it, as it is announced, including long-range strike capabilities explicitly intended to hit North Korean targets in the event that Japan is attacked, we're going to need structures, uh, need mechanisms that bring Japan formally into the discussion about contingency response. So this seems to me to be the next step in the trilateral relationship among the United States, the South Korea, and Japan. Well, that's all the time we have for this week. Mr. Snyder, Mr. Johnstone, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for watching. We'll be back here next week with U.S. experts to discuss the two Koreas and the region right here from Washington.